Walt Disney's Fantasia. I don't know if you ever saw that. Yes, I did. But have. it was, yeah. I got so excited. I remember I bought uh, Saucer's Apprentice in Mickey Mouse, and they made this cartoon with Mickey Mouse. It was just wonderful. But the music was the Saucer's Apprentice, just played. It was Lukowski conducting yet. Mm. And I bought the record. And I was listening, and I constant listen, listen. I have a problem, I'll tell you, with Sorcerer's Apprentice, because when we get to a certain point, I had to turn the record over. And when we get to, oh. I listen to it now, I expect the space at that point. <laughs> da, 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 da. Okay, now we go forward. <laughs> when they play it straight through, it always jars me, because where, what happened to my space? Well, within reason. <laughs> okay, what can I tell you? Robert, this is so lovely to talk to you. And I must say, this is so beautiful where you are. This, oh, well, um, thank you. Is, yeah. is that your home? That's yes. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Mm. The house Very has... Nice. Yeah. Yeah, the house has glass windows all around. Mm. So... Uh, I feel mm -hmm. like I'm in the middle of the jungle here, so it's very, very yeah, attractive. But, yeah, but it's it's great, and um, and you know, with the natural light coming, and you must be always happy. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So I want. Yeah, you know, I. I'm, uh, thank you so much for your time, and I. I read uh, that you are um, a broadcaster, an author. You have so many. A music critic. You have so much to, to tell, and, and uh, it would be so interesting to talk to you. Well, I'm happy to talk to you yeah. as well. Yeah. So ask away. Yeah. So I, um, I want to know how did you get into broadcasting in originally? Well, things were very different 60 years ago, yeah. uh, which is actually when I started at WQXR. I started as a typist. Really? So uh, started at the bottom, as the legend goes. Mm. But I will admit uh, there was some connection that I'm sure helped along the way. Mm. My mother is the pianist Nadia Reisenberg. And mother was longtime um, close associate of WQXR. She gave recitals there a number of broadcast programs through the years. So actually, that's why I knew so Q QXR so well. And when I came out of the Army, mm -hmm. I applied for a job there. And I'm sure uh, uh, Mother's Connection didn't hurt anything. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. yes, uh, but I got a job, and I was a typist. I was typing up cards for the music department. And because... I somehow had in my mind that I'd have to go way out to some small town and learn the business first. I was thrilled to be the station I had known all my life. And uh, I worked like a dog because I loved working like a dog mm -hmm. at that time and in that place. And gradually I moved up through the ranks. I got to be, uh, well, I don't know, director of recorded music first and then music director and then program director. And Amazing. eventually, as I, as I realized, I had started a, um, the first dozen years or so I was QXR, I was purely executive. Mm -hmm. I was, as I said, program director and all kinds of stuff like that. But in 19, let's see now, 1969, mm -hmm. is that right? Sounds an awful long time ago. But I think it was 1969. Yeah. We decided to do a folk music program. Mm. And at that time, folk music was the big thing, you know, big deal. This was before the Beatles. This was this was when folk music was king. Hoot Nanny was the biggest show on TV. And uh, we decided we needed a contemporary folk show. Well, all the people they approached to do the program. Pete Seeger and Oscar Brand, they either were doing a program already 
<laughs> or they couldn't be bothered with a station that, uh, you know, who's going to know folk music at a classical station. So they couldn't really find anybody to do the program. And so finally, in desperation, they said, all right, you do it. So I did it. Mm. And uh, by some stroke of luck, it turned out to be one of the most popular programs the station had, even though purely mm. cla or mostly classical station. But these people also had grown up with folk music and were very excited to have it on their station. Mm. And the next year, I began a classical music program. And once I did that, and I was starting to do interviews, because as soon as uh, uh, P PR people and managers discovered there was a classical outlet here, and mm -hmm. uh, I began doing interviews with artists as they were coming through New York. Mm -hmm. And once I realized I had some kind of a talent for this, I began to lose interest in the executive part. I didn't want to be a uh, program director. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that I, I much happier dealing with the thing, dealing with artists, speaking with them, planning music programs, and so forth. And so gradually, I, I quit as program director. I just moved down to, I, what are they? It gave me some weird time the director of special projects or something or other. Oh, yeah, but I was yeah. doing all kinds of programs as they came along. And uh, the most important, since it still exists now, uh, arrived in 1978, and that was the Young Artist Showcase. Mm -hmm. That's a program, as the name suggests, uh, bringing young artists um, to the stage. Now, all the time, QXR is playing the greatest uh, you know, the greatest music by the greatest artists. And here I am deciding I want to bring music by artists they never heard of because they're just starting out. And as a result, the program had a certain distinction and it grew and it's still going. It is in its, I don't know, I don't know 43rd year or something like that. And then from that, evolved all sorts of other adventures because I moved sideways. I never left QXR in all this time. Mm. But I also started doing some writing and doing some other ancillary thing. I began doing narrations and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And this, initially, did you want to go into broadcasting when you uh, went to do the, the first job as a typist? Did, did, was this your goal to do that? Or did everything just evolve as it's... It's hard to say. I mean, who knows what I was thinking back you know, <laughs> okay. 60 years ago. But um, I would say that I wanted to do something in music. Okay. Mm. I didn't know quite what, but I wanted to do something. And I, as I said, I grew up with QXR. So, mm. I and I love to play music for my friends. I would bring them over and say, listen to this Shostakovich piece. Isn't that terrific? Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea of bringing programs and working with uh, in radio seemed a very natural outlet for me, and so that's that's actually how I drifted into it. Didn't know quite what I wanted to do, and it mm -hmm. took a dozen years before I realized what I really wanted yeah, to do. Yeah. And uh, but I was young; I had time, so I was able to go with that. And your, your mom was a pianist, and did you also play the piano? I did. Mm. Um, I, I, I mean, I studied with mother, but she always said, for heaven's sakes, don't tell anybody that you study with me because I'm oh. not a typical product of, you know, I had, when I was, when I was a, a teenager, I, I happened not to like Bach. I didn't want to play Bach. I didn't like Bach. Mm. Do something. And when mother would tell you, you know, use the fourth finger here, I said, no, I like it better this way. Okay. And it was, it, she was, I wasn't afraid of her, in other mm -hmm. words. And somehow I had a talent, but I didn't have the discipline. And so I played, I had some party pieces. I played certain pieces very well. Mm -hmm. uh, because eventually i you know i did it over and over and over until i could, could do it and i won a talent contest in the in while i was in the army you know this kind of stuff hmm. because i could play my two or three pieces very well 
Mm. And uh, so that's what happened. I played. I still fuss around a little bit once in a while. But um, all of these many other things you mentioned are uh, kind of in the past tense now. I mean, I haven't written music criticism for, I don't know, 25 years. Or so. Oh, really? <laughs> so, you know, yeah. when, when, you, when you have lived a very long life as I have, then you uh, look back on a lot of stuff that you did. And sometimes you wonder how you did it, but, you know. Yeah, but it all fell into place then, like yeah. that. I mean, yeah. as you're going, you do it. You do yeah. it. You don't realize that you're doing something special. You just know you're doing what. You, that's your job. Yeah. I'm sure you have the same idea. You're talking to people. You're in. You don't realize, perhaps. I guess you will. Yeah. That you have accumulated a mass of documentation that is extremely valuable. Mm. Well, that's what happened with me. I was interviewing all these people, and you know, Pavarotti comes in, and then there's Domingo next door, and uh, what? Mm. So yeah, so somehow you develop a, um, I don't know, an oeuvre, mm. a, a, a sort of a life work that is, at least people tell me, is quite significant. Mm. Yeah, I do agree, and and, and I, I find it so interesting because I'm not a musician, I'm not an artist, but I uh, hear what they was, are saying, and, and maybe also because I'm not an artist and have that life, I ask different questions and I, I receive it differently. I don't know, but uh, it's been very valuable for me as well. I understand exactly what you mean uh, by listening to to these stories and listening to... Uh, the different artists. Um, I'm also actually, it's it's very interesting that you say that you had the pro uh, program for the young artists because I'm also very interested in the young students um, here in Vienna and also, you know, younger musicians who start out because I think they have also a different energy in, in the way they do things, you know, and, and maybe they also are the ones that try new things and different things. Did you find that also in those times? Well, it's very intriguing to me that that the performance level continues to rise. I mean, the technical quality. But of course, um, musicians, <laughs> musicality is harder to come by because mm. that's a, a very different kind of gift. Many people can stay in the studio and, and get, you know, they have even little kids, six years old, are playing these his, uh, Mozart sonatas, and you say, well, mm -hmm. gee, how can a six-year-old kid do that? And yet, uh, very rarely will a six-year-old kid have the musicality, will have the understanding, will have the maturity to deal with the music as it should be. So um, I find it fascinating that so many young artists have that quality that go beyond just playing the notes, uh, go to the point of really understanding. And when I find artists that are special that way, I am thrilled to present them. And many, many artists now, you know, big names, the major artists of our time, were teenagers and, and a little beyond when they came to the showcase originally. So Carter Bray comes to mind. He's the first cellist of the New York Philharmonic. I think he was 13 or 14 when he was first on the program. And uh, so many others like that were on very early. Gil Shaham and, uh, I don't know, uh, I remember Gil and Orly, his uh, sister, played very early on for me. Nadia Solerna Sonnenberg was there as a teenager. All of these, it gives me also great, satisfaction to watch the talent grow, watch their careers evolve. And the kid that I taught when he was at Manhattan School is now winning the Avery Fisher Career Grant and then is moving on in all different directions. So yeah, it's a very exciting uh, pageant mm. to see floating as you go by. Mm. And do you think in, this, in the years that uh, classical music have become less popular uh, maybe because of this very high standard that that 
has been put for for artists you know that that classical music is almost as if it is a bit distant for some people i i think i disagree on that count i don't think classical music is less popular mm. now i will say i'm not sure of what's going on in europe of course or even south africa even less yeah. but um here in the united states music has more and more been cut from the school operations. Mm -hmm. So when when things get difficult, when finances are tight, they're not going to uh, disband the football team, God forbid, yeah. but yeah. the music class or the art class, well, sure, we are, who cares about that? We can cut that. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in, in public school, I had music appreciation days we learned this is the symphony that schubert wrote and never finished you know we learned all these things uh, sometimes we didn't know what we were learning but we were exposed to it now we're not now most kids do not have that opportunity and so there's a it takes longer for them to realize what there is in classical music and what therefore what they're missing by avoiding it but classical music was never the most popular ever, ever, ever. There were always 10, 12, 15% of the population mm -hmm. that even the music loving population that really enjoyed classical music. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I don't think it's any less, it's less popular. It's just that it takes different forms now and they're mixing and matching. You know, you have classical artists playing popular things and popular artists playing classical. So there's a, there's a, a, um, a, I don't know what to call it, a washing together of ideas. Mm. You know, in, I think it was 1937 or something, and Benny Goodman, the um, jazz clarinetist, gave a classical concert. In, in, not a, well, I shouldn't say that. Gave a concert of his mm. own music, and I think added some classical pieces. But this was Carnegie Hall, and everybody said, how can you bring jazz to Carnegie Hall? Mm. But at that point, jazz was jazz, and classical was classical, and never the two shall, <laughs> the twain shall meet. Yeah. Now, very different. Now there's a complete mingling of forms, and movie scores are made up of classical and jazz and, and synth synthesized pieces, all kinds of things of that sort. So... It's different, but I don't think it's less. And people worry, well, all the white-haired people in the audience. Well, mm. 20 years ago, there were also white-haired people in the audience. Oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 you know, it takes a while yeah. for the maturity to come in. So while there are, and that's what's so wonderful about when you find young artists so excited about classical music. It's thrilling. It gives you all your, yourself a sort of boost to know that, yes, there is a future here. Yeah. I actually uh, went to a concert recently. Um, it's a, a young, it's four young Belgian uh, musicians, uh, Floris and the Flames. They have red hair. That's why they call themselves Floris and the uh, Flames. But it was, it's such a, it's such a um, sort of a, a rock and roll name or a, or a, you know like a florist and the flames you wouldn't expect but they play classical music but of course they have uh you know made it a little bit more lively and changed a little bit and play bach with with uh guitar and things like that and, and the violin yeah. and so on and i it it was really uh so enjoyable and even my daughter is is 27 and she said well Mom, I feel like getting up and, and dancing to this. And it, it was all, it's classical music, but it's just they, you know, they rearranged it a little bit and so on. So what is your opinion about that type of thing that you think if, if musicians start doing also things like that and then just connecting with, like you say, they're now in the schools, you don't have that exposure to music anymore, but that in, in a way uh, that musicians connect with a younger audience and maybe bring a younger audience to be uh, starting to at least uh, appreciate it, even if it's on that level, but that that could grow and, and evolve into starting 
uh, appreciating classical music. Any way we can get there is a good way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mean, how many of us, not you, you're too young and you uh, grew up elsewhere, but how many of us learned classical music or what classical music was mm -hmm. from Bugs Bunny cartoons? Mm -hmm. All those cartoons used classical music frequently. And they're, they are, to watch them now is very, very funny. But you realize, oh, yeah, that's the Largo Alpha Cotton. That came from you know, this cartoon. And so you learn things. And then as, I, as we started talking about, jazz and, and rock artists start infiltrating classical pieces or themes. And you have, uh, you know, all kinds of versions. I have... Uh, I, I think I did the Four Seasons once with one, each movement with a different instrument. There's one version I have for Kotos, <laughs> I mean, for instance. And yes, it brings a new, it's not just the same old, same old. It has mm -hmm. something lively, and that will pique the attention or pique the interest of certain, certain people that otherwise mm -hmm. wouldn't have known about it. Mm -hmm. I've... I think I can date my own love for classical music. Now, again, my mother was a great pianist. I heard her practicing all day long and teaching all day long. I was exposed to this music, but it didn't really register, I don't think, until and I think the year was 1938, nine, somewhere in there, Walt Disney's Fantasia. I don't know if you ever saw that. Yes, I did. But it was... Yeah. I got so excited. I remember I bought uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice in Mickey Mouse, and they made this cartoon with Mickey Mouse. It was just wonderful. But the music was a Sorcerer's Apprentice, just played. It was Lukowski conducting it. Mm. And I bought the record. And I was listening, and I constant listen, listen. I have a problem, I'll tell you, with Sorcerer's Apprentice, because when we get to a certain point, I had to turn the record over. And when I get to, uh, I listen to it now, I expect the space at that point. <laughs> da, 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 da. Okay, now yeah. we go for it. <laughs> when they play it straight through, it always jars me because it's weird. Yeah. what happens in my space? You know? yeah. But uh, that, I listened to the Schumann songs. I don't know what, uh, the Dance of the Hours, I think, was there. But whatever, I would listen to these things over and over. All of a sudden, I got very excited about this kind of music. And I guess with my mother playing all the time, I took it for granted. <laughs> I didn't, mm -hmm. that, was, that was it. I didn't think much about it one way or the other. And all of a sudden, uh, I saw what music could do and what music could mean and how a story could be told. And the uh, pastoral symphony, suddenly uh, all these Greek gods, <laughs> it, was, it, it created a new spirit and a new excitement for me. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I can't really say how, which, or why, but at the age of eight or nine, there I'm all I'm hooked already. Mm. Yeah, that's what I also think sometimes about. Uh, well, during the lockdown time, a lot of our young musicians here started playing in the streets and and in the parks, and um, I loved it in the because I think. It was all dressed down, you know, they had jeans and their T-shirts on and they were playing and it was not perfect, but it was just, you know, it had also this energy and, 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 and fun about it. And you could see also young children come and watch. And I sometimes think that that is so important that music can be done that way, that it's not just left for the concert hall or left for the opera house, but that it can be like that in the street and informal and attract, you know, like you say, you were hooked by this film, but it can be that somebody else can, uh, that another child can be hooked because of somebody playing on the street. Absolutely. Yeah. The point is that once you take the idea of classical music as being very stuffy and very, yes, in the concert hall and everybody has to be very quiet and all this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now we have hundreds of thousands of people at concerts in the park 
and everybody oh. loves it and they don't worry that they're that there's a wine clinking bottle <laughs> no. next door you, you just enjoy it yeah yeah you know if you look at the old movies mm. 1930s even 40s and beyond. I love those movies. Yeah. But any t- yes, me too. But any time you see a concert, the cliche is the husband falling asleep. Oh yeah. And but you also notice if you if you pay attention, everybody's all dressed up. Mm. They're all in, if not tuxedo, all in very elegant clothes. It, it was not something you did on the street. It was not something you yeah. did. Uh, for fun, it was something mm-hmm. that was very, very purposeful and all of that. Uh, that has changed. Mm-hmm. Now you go to the Met Opera and there are people in jeans. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think the Met Opera is too happy about it, but nonetheless, it brings people mm-hmm. in that otherwise would not think of coming to a mm-hmm. hall. The other thing that I spoke, I, I had, I did a series and in, in during lockdown. Uh, where I spoke to artists in lockdown, and I raised this question uh, because I uh, wanted to to uh, find out what it is about artists in uh, you know that they felt during this time not valued. Um, and I wonder uh, what is your opinion about communication from artists? So, we, for example, like I say, we hear the music, we go to the concert, we see them on stage. Um, but don't you think it's also, I mean, you, you've you done the interviews, so you've spoken to them, you've seen them, they sat in front of you, uh, and you could connect with them in that way. So that makes it also different because you you could see the personality in a, in a different way. But don't you think it is also important that artists start talking about the art, about the music, about what they are playing, what the inspiration is, um, without just being in an interview? Uh, you know that, that that's communicated in a different way. You have hit upon what I would say the essence of what I've done all my life. Mm-hmm. The whole idea of an interview if it's done the way I think an interview should be done, is precisely what you were talking about. Why? And never mind that the artist plays this Beethoven sonata wonderfully, but why? Why did he choose Beethoven and not Mozart? Why did he, which edition did he use? Why is is this important? I remember Claudia Arau telling me that there was something that Beethoven had written that was very difficult to do. There was a hand crossing required. And I said, well, why don't you... You can do it differently. I said, no. If Beethoven wrote it that way, he wanted you to stumble mm-hmm. and struggle. He wanted that sense of tension to be there. So, yes, you find out all sorts of things. You learn all sorts of things about the music as well as the artist. Mm. Where did they come from? What was their training? What did, how do they see the evolution? All the questions you've been asking me, I like to ask them. And I feel... And we've done this not only on on the air, but in in many um, pre concert events and and other moderating panels and whatnot. Uh, it's exactly that to find out what's behind the artist's ideas, what makes the artist decide on one pattern or another, choose one piece or another, choose one method of playing, how do they react to an audience, all this kind of thing, uh, I find fascinating, and apparently listeners do as well, and you do. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is exactly why I have done these interviews all the way. I mean, QXR, the rest of the day, my station, the rest of the day and the rest of the night, they say, all right, next we have uh, Sasson's Organ Symphony. Mm. Here it is, and such and such, the soloist and so on, orchestra. And blah, blah. Mm. Well, I did an interview with Virgil Fox, the uh, organist, when he was recording this with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And we had a whole hour talking about how he approaches, what kind of stops, how do you decide which stops to use, what about the orchestra, how loud can you play? I don't know what, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's 30 years ago, who remembers what I asked and what he answered? But the, that's why these tapes are so valuable, by the way, because you yeah. can find out. But yeah. 
the idea is that exactly was the purpose mm -hmm. and why I think my programs stood out mm -hmm. from the rest of the broadcast schedule because I did go behind. I would, not, I mean, just between us, QXR is basically a very conservative station. Yeah. Uh, we play big thing and when, when they have something that's really naughty and difficult to understand, we kind of put it off in a corner somewhere and, and hope nobody will notice that it's not playing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But I could bring all sorts of composers into the studio and instead of hearing oh now what is this piece going to be about mm -hmm. the composer tells us i wrote this because my father was very ill because oh, i wrote this okay. and i needed mm -hmm. some kind of i don't know and all of a sudden you're listening differently mm -hmm. it's not just a piece of music but it's a piece of music evolving from a circumstance that the artist has explained to you mm -hmm. and it's exactly that kind of depth that I feel I'm able to uh, to reveal to our listeners. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, as, as as sometimes I sit and listen, and and also it it just it's for me just uh, so interesting. And I just think if everybody could hear what this person <laughs> is saying. But what I also um, discovered in the time, and I, um, you, you might be able to tell me if you did too, is that they, you, you learn so many life lessons through talking to them. The way they see the world, the way they, they make decisions, the way they just approach things. I sometimes think if, if people just listen to, to that, you know, or just get that out of the interview, even if they're not interested in the music, but just their approach, how they got there, um, you know, that that already, for me, are so valuable life lessons that I, that I get from them. Well, absolutely. I mean, you are, we're very much on the same wavelength. We have yeah. the same ideas and we, <laughs> it's we are trying to do exactly the same thing. Yeah. And uh, look, I have done interviews with, uh, there was one point, um, one of the programs I was doing was sponsored by Scientific American magazine. Mm -hmm. Now, I would look at this magazine. We had to, we brought, they brought in the publisher. Instead of an ad, a commercial, we, uh, the publisher did a little interview with me, mm -hmm. uh, centerpiece interview. And each of these interviews would deal with a different article that was in that month's issue. Well, I could not understand a word that was being written. I didn't understand what in the world, what are they talking about this biofeedback and there's all kinds of stuff I never, mm -hmm. but perhaps because I didn't know anything about it, mm -hmm. I could ask the questions that a lot of people were interested yeah, in yeah. because they also didn't understand what was going on. Exactly. So You see, yeah, I'm, it, I'm blonde, so I ask questions from this uh, this brain. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, I don't and... know how much that has to do with it, <laughs> but I do think that yes, if you approach mm -hmm. these artists as um, well, I don't know how to how to phrase it exactly, but these are people who have thought deeply about yeah. the music they are playing. Yeah. It's not just sitting down and playing. It's mm -hmm. A lifetime in some instances of thinking about it, examining it, re-examining it. What did the composer say? What does this manuscript indicate? Well, why did he erase that sharp and put in, an, you know, all of these questions. Uh, and they don't require musical knowledge no. to understand and appreciate what mm. it is. So it's it's the idea, this old concept that you... You can't go to a classical concert if you haven't taken five yeah, years yeah. of uh, studies on classical. But no, it's garbage. But, it helps. It may give you a deeper understanding, of course, but mm -hmm. it's not necessary. And to understand something behind the music, behind mm -hmm. the thought that produced this particular uh, sound that you're hearing is as fascinating in a way as the music itself. Yeah. And what I also find interesting is that um, 
I also ask them uh, what shoes they wear because you know I never realized. I'm sorry, that say that again. What, what what shoes they wear, and because you know what uh, I never realized that a violinist it's important how they stand and what shoes they wear, okay. and I never realized that, and. And, you know, these little things that, that they have to think about, you know, it's not, we don't realize it, we see them on the stage, you don't realize that there has gone even thought in their shoes, the shoes that they wear. Um, and a pianist told me that, that she can only wear certain shoes when she does recordings because the tapping on the pedal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, that, that gets into the sound. And, and that I also find interesting, that that they really have to think about everything. You know, they don't, it's not just about the music that they're going to play. Uh, they have to think about all these things. But there, was you, a folk, there was a folk singer called Oscar Brand, mm -hmm. who had her own radio show for years and years and years. And he was known at the beginning of his career, was known as the shoeless troubadour for exactly that reason. Really? He would, he would keep the rhythm going and it would be like a drum going. <laughs> and they felt it was distracting, so they... So, yeah. There Take are your shoes off. Yeah. 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 But you also wrote a book. Um, what is it? The Complete Guide to Classical Music for Idiots or something? Is it well, there was a whole it? series yeah. uh, called The Idiot's Guide to... Oh, okay. To, to okay. cooking... Okay to yeah. finance, to, I don't know, yeah. pulling teeth, yeah. whatever it is. They had <laughs> 20 different books on 20 different subjects. Yeah. And the idea, mm -hmm. uh, there's another uh, separate series called The Dummies Guide to, and the same kind yeah. of thing. If you're yeah. cooking, uh, I know I once tried to make a banana bread when nobody mm -hmm. was home, and I looked at the thing and said, sift the flour. Mm. What does that mean, sift the flour? I don't know what that means. So yeah. throw that recipe out, you know. <laughs> uh, there are certain things that you just don't yeah. quite grasp. And mm -hmm. yes, that that's all part of the learning process and the fascination process. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. What they wear, what they wear can be very important, actually, to the image that they create. Yeah, and some people, yeah. We had a, a group of uh, composers here that made a st statement of sorts by wearing red socks. And they oh, were known as the <laughs> red socks composers. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, but, I mean, most of that is a, is a gimmick if, if you yeah. try to yeah. make something out of it. But mm -hmm. sometimes it's necessary, like a, like yeah. a violinist needing to stand and, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you um, do at the moment? Are you now retired? Do you still do interviews? Do you still do any uh, The two programs that I have, I think, referred to, the Young Artist Showcase, yeah. is going forth every week. Now that mm -hmm. I can record at home, mm -hmm. so I don't have to run to the studio, which was about to, I was about to tell them I'm not going to do this anymore. But yeah. recording from home simplifies it. So yeah. I have been recording that, and uh, this is now, I believe, in our 43rd, maybe 44th year. We began in 78. I don't know. I'm not too good with math, but somewhere mm -hmm. up there. And yeah. that is continuing every week. Okay. And um, the folk music program that mm -hmm. I first began doing is now in its, I think, 53rd or 54th year, and that's still going every week. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's all part, that, that, that essence to me is, I, I can't, I can't think of retiring until I have to retire. Yeah. Or they yeah. throw me out. That's another option. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, uh, there's so many things that I have done that I don't do now. I taught for t 20 years at uh, Juilliard, but mm -hmm. it's not something I continued or wanted to continue. I, mm -hmm. I don't have that energy mm, that mm. is required for that kind of a course so i can't you know i i, I couldn't do it even if i wanted to do it mm. but the broadcasts um, really what got my life on the course that it has taken mm. and i love doing those programs I, I i i like to interweave things and ideas and follow through and have uh, ideas that that take 
a, tr a thread that can be followed. It's like doing a crossword puzzle for me. It just, mm -hmm. It's an exciting process, and then, ah, there it is now. I got a program. Yeah. So, yeah, that's continuing. But you must know so ma much, uh, so many of the music. I mean, is, is there something you you don't know about because of, after all these years you must have played so many um wonderful pieces and and spoke well you've spoken to many artists so uh your knowledge of music must be so broad well yes you know yes and no i'm not I'm not the musicologist type. I haven't really examined all the inners and ins and outs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It is much more of a, of a, I don't want to say layman, but it's much more of a interested person's approach okay. to these things. So when I talk to artists, I'm, I don't go in with a list of questions yeah. because I just want to get the essence of their personality. And wherever I start, we'll, we'll go from there. And, we'll, and my question will depend on the previous answer because mm -hmm. it's a flow, or I try to maintain a flow. So that, that's kind of the idea. So I, mm -hmm. yes, I've learned a lot, but, but sort of learned it not from books, but learned it from life, if you, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And are, were there ever p uh, music that you, that you just thought you you wouldn't play because it's not uh, to your taste or do you still play that anyway i am very conscious of the station that i'm broadcasting now the folk program that i mentioned at one point wqxr decided it was going to be 100 percent classical mm -hmm. they didn't want a folk show anymore so they they weren't going to continue it it's called woody's children they weren't going to continue it well, I went to another station, uh, another public station called WFUV, which is based at Fordham University, and they took it on. Well, on one hand, I'm in this little corner. I'm playing folk music on a classical station, so it's a little weird. Now I'm, on a, I'm playing folk music on a station that is mostly popular, mostly rock. Yeah. So I have shifted a little bit in both instances, but I am aware of the places that I'm, of the station that I'm broadcasting to, but I basically follow what I think is the proper path for my particular program. Okay. So the Woody's Children is essentially a folk, uh, uh, what shall I say, urban folk program. Mm -hmm. It's not the traditional uh, singers in the Kentucky mountains, but it's the mm -hmm. artists that represent the uh, Pete Seeger. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the preeminent kind of person that I'm looking for, that has a deep meaning and yet, uh, in a very straightforward, simple way, not adorned, no big orchestral accompaniments and fancy drum rolls and whatever, just getting the message across through singing, though. That is the ideal that I have. So I will depart from it knowing that it's, if it's the FUV station, I can go a little more pop. I can go okay. a little more uh, yeah. highly arranged. And if it's QXR, I know I can go a little, little more oh, classical. Okay. <laughs> you know that. And I will try to do it. Now, uh, Tom Chapin, folk mm -hmm. singer, very well known here, uh, has a wonderful song about Yo-Yo Ma. Mm. That uh, uh, somebody from Yo Yo, that Yo Yo company came and one, and he said, "Well, you got to talk to Yo Yo's ma." And it's a whole interplay of words that way. And oh, he has a okay. so you know, it's a marvelous yeah. little thing. I'm delighted to play it, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it's hard to explain mm. what is right, what I feel is right. Mm. Uh, I, that would be a whole different lecture. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> a whole different interview uh, because it's very hard to explain. Mm -hmm. I just know uh, I am aware, for instance, that if I'm going to plan this classical program, uh, one of my young artists showcase, I am not going to have a whole uh, whole program of Stockhouse. 
Mm -hmm. I just know the audience won't accept it. Mm -hmm. But I also know that certain, I, I look for new pieces that are, for the sake of a better phrase, uh, audience friendly, that uh, are that mm -hmm. are pieces that will not shake everybody up, especially mm -hmm. if I can explain a little bit about it. But th he wrote this piece because he just had met an old friend and he wanted to have this mixing of mood. I don't know, but whatever yeah. it is, Again, mm. uh, even if there's not an interview, if it's just me talking about it, I will try to use the words of the artist, if possible, or the ideas of the artist to set the mood for this particular piece. Mm. Again, it's not an interview, but it's, it's a form of transmitting what would have been in an interview if we had yeah. one. Yeah. So I do it both ways. Yeah, and it's also maybe a, a type of education, you know, of, of uh, because I think sometimes we, we are so used to listening to the same things and the same music and and when something new comes along, it's, you have to sort of get eased into it, you know. And uh, so maybe in that sense, to educate a little bit, do you want to, you know, well, again, there are so many ways of looking around. Now there's a phone here. It can't be anything important. Mm. Oh, come on, stop it already. Mm. Anyway, yeah. uh, I, I've already forgot the question. But the, oh, no, I said the educate. You know that you are educating your your audience in a way. Yes, to, but you sort don't. Of slow, yeah, introduce new things. You know, WQXR. It started as a commercial station in 1936. Mm -hmm. And shortly afterwards, they had a, I don't know, there was, they posted a series of goals, what it is they want to do. And one of them I always loved. It said, to educate the public, but never let them know that you're educating them. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to say, all right, our lesson today is, yeah. what year was Tchaikovsky? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. But yeah. to feed interesting facts yeah. along the way, yeah. that I try to do constantly. Mm -hmm. Because if I, all of a sudden I'll find that this piece, gee, this was written exactly 50 years ago. Well, that makes it has a kind of a special interest aside, nothing to do, doesn't make the music better in it or change it in any way, but it's it's an interesting fact or something about the composer or the fact that it was written just at the beginning of World War II or whatever. Yeah. It 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 it's a way of quote educating. It's a yeah. way of making informing, it, maybe, informing. Yeah. that's a better yeah. word. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You you are just fleshing out the setting of the music and the purpose of the music or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And it, for that reason, gives you, I think, gives the listener a new sense of, gee, he's really talking to me. That's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. so that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. It's so interesting to talk to you. I think um, I, 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 it's really... What are you going to do with all this? So you have a... An hour of me blabbing away. I'm, yeah. what, what <laughs> it's very interesting. It? Is, uh, may I post it on, on my YouTube channel? Well, you can do whatever you want, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know who else will be interested, but absolutely. Sure. No, I think, well, I, I believe that, that this is very important that we talk about this and, and your, all your knowledge and your experience. And so it's, uh, it's wonderful to hear about that. And um, and yeah, and I'm I'm also I'm actually very passionate about the education because I think um, it should really be that every child in the world should be have the exposure to some form of art, even if it's just to to you know help with their development or give them a, a way of expressing themselves. But I so wish that it things can change in the schools because i know it's a lot of a lot of uh, people have been saying the same thing that you know art education is taken out of schools and uh, people you know children are very much uh, sort of 
pressured on doing maths and science and so on. And there's such a great link between arts and maths and science. So it could really be uh, alongside these subjects that, that children should be taught art. So um, maybe when we speak about that, maybe, you know, well, we it's also it. it's also in a way the job of parents to yeah. help their children develop this wider mm -hmm. range of information and knowledge and 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 enjoyment. Yeah. You know, if you don't, if you never eat ice cream, you don't know what you're missing. Exactly. But once you find yeah. out what that is, then mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. your your daughter. Uh, gained a full knowledge of all of this, even though you're not a musician. Mm. You don't have to be a musician. You don't have to be a musician to enjoy music. Yeah. So that's exactly yeah. it. I mean, my dad, uh, where I grew up in South Africa, there wasn't a theater in the city where we lived. And um, But my dad used to play uh, records uh, um, of operas and operators and in the house always. And this is how I my love for music started and, and because I was exposed to it in, in that way. Okay. And, but that, I, I think it's important that, that children hear that or that, you know, at least in some form and, and, or even dancing or visual arts or any mm -hmm. form of art, I think is very important for, for education and development. So well, um, Robert, thank you so much for your time. It's afternoon now. You're probably going to have a lovely lunch. Well, yeah. Actually, the day is nice here, so. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you'll uh, have a nice supper, I hope. And I'm going to have my supper now. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, but, thank you so much. and uh, I thank you, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'm yeah. so pleased to have met you. And uh, if yes. the occasion arises again, you let me know. Thank you very much. And I maybe we meet in person one day. That would be lovely. I hope so. Would yeah, be nice. okay. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. I hope to speak things. to you soon. Bye. Thank you.